APU. American Public University is proud to present Intellectable. Welcome to the podcast, Intellectable. I'm your host, Dr. Gary Deal. Today we're talking about the value of higher education in professional careers. My guest today is Dr. Marie Gould Harper, Dean of the School of Business at American Public University. She holds an undergraduate degree in psychology from Wellesley College, a master's degree in instructional systems from Pennsylvania State University, and a doctorate in business from Capella University. She is a progressive coach, facilitator, writer, strategist, and human resources and organizational development professional with more than 30 years of leadership, project management, and administrative experience. She has worked in both corporate and academic environments. Dr. Gould Harper is an innovative thinker and influential leader, manifesting people skills, a systematic approach to problems, organizational vision, and the ability to inspire followers. She is committed to continuous improvement in organizational effectiveness and human capital development, customer service, and the development of future leaders. Marie, welcome to Intellectable, and thank you for being our guest today. Thank you. Absolutely. So we had chatted about this topic, and and with full disclosure, um, I have an article series in the works that is an adaptation of my dissertation work from UNLV on the value of higher education specific to the hospitality industry. But today I wanted to chat with you about what value higher education brings sort of more generically in professional careers. And obviously there's a lot of nuance between different disciplines and fields. But there are competing schools of thought on this in terms of whether higher education is essential, and if not essential, is it important or valuable in some ways? And if it is, how so? So you have a lot of experience, obviously, in the higher education world and and both in as well as in organizational contexts of human resources and hiring and, and human capital management. What's your take on uh, the traditional value of higher education and whether or not that is changing? Um, thank you, Gary. That's a, I wanted to say that's a loaded question, but um, it's an interesting question timely for now, given our economic situation, experiencing the pandemic. I would say that higher education is still relevant, but not in the way of the past. We are like any other industry we will need to look at ourselves and reinvent ourselves to fit in what's going to happen post pandemic. By that, even before the economic crisis that we're experiencing right now, there were members of the private sector who questioned whether or not a bachelor's degree was relevant. And I believe some of these conversations started as a result of some organizations continuing to be frustrated with the quality of graduates. They didn't feel as though that um, graduates um, from higher education institutions had the proper skills to come in to their organizations and be ready to do the work required. And what has made the situation even more relevant is the fact the pandemic has forced a number of companies to rethink their way of business. What will that look like in the future? And a part of that discussion is what type of workforce will they need? So when we talk about higher education, and obviously, as you mentioned, things have changed uh, across the landscape. We're recording this uh, podcast in October of 2020. We are still very much amidst the global COVID pandemic. And unfortunately here in the US, it seems to have lasted longer and, and had more pronounced effects you know, in our society for a number of different reasons, but we are by no means out of the woods. And and what's interesting, I think, is that higher education as an industry is inversely correlated with the economy. So right now, uh, economic times are, are quite difficult. A lot of people on unemployment and a lot of people struggling to, to find work and find ways to put food on the table and so on. And so enrollments, generally speaking, across higher education have seen a spike, uh, which is not to be unexpected um, given what's happened. And again, given that inverse correlation. Um, But are people looking at, in, in your view, sort of the approach to higher education during this time differently than they have in the past? I would say I think they are. Um, Yesterday, I attended a workshop that was sponsored by CNBC Evolve Spotlight, and um, it was dealing with the middle market. 
some of the things that were said as it relates to human capital was that many of the organizations are looking at this period of time. Um, some companies are referring to the next two to five years as the intermediate economy. And basically that's a period of time that they will refocus on where they wanna go instead of looking to get things back to how things were and identifying areas that they need to change their business, whether it's to go into a new line of business, um, whether they need different equipment in order to survive. And both of those factors will require them to also look at the workforce. And one of the terms that I heard was um, the workforce has to be able to pivot. And I understand that. That was a concern even before the pandemic. And what that basically refers to is that when you and what we have tend to do in higher ed is we have a student who wants to go in a particular field of study. They study that particular field. But if you don't prepare that student to be able to understand the other factors in the organization, if a change or a crisis such as the pandemic occurs, you have a workforce that can only do one thing. Organizations have realized um, through this crisis that they need their employees to be able to be flexible and be able to pivot and change direction almost immediately. Just how we see technology changes, it used to be every six months, some will say every three months, employees are gonna to have to be able to shift and change when things affect the market. So what these leaders were talking about was what was needed in terms of upskilling and reskilling the workforce. I personally believe that's where higher ed can be relevant if I was the leader of a particular institution, I would want to focus on how do we help these companies because we're part of the problem or we have to come up with a, a solution as well on meeting the needs of, of these organizations. I would focus on giving them what they want. And I think what they want is how, what is the best way and what type of learning and development program would fit in the short term, which is, I believe, the next two to five years? How do we assist these companies with retooling their employees? And that's where upskilling and reskilling comes into play. And I believe as institutions partner with certain corporations um, for the short term, once they get on their feet, then we can start talking about what degrees or what other certificate programs would make sense for those particular organizations. So I think it's a partnership between higher ed and the other industries to find out what they need instead of telling them what they need and then coming up with a short term as well as long term plan on what does the new design of learning and development for an organization looks like? And for us, what role do we play in that? One of the things that I focused on in my dissertation work that I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on is the difference between the idea that higher education serves a needed function in terms of imparting, for lack of a better term, KSAs, which uh, the government would define as uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities these things that employees must be able to understand and do and perform uh, that are essential to their future jobs and their future careers. That's sort of one school of thought. The other school of thought is, is and, and there's more than two, this isn't a dichotomous scenario, but um, another popular school of thought is sort of the credentialing theory and the idea that that higher education may not be, strictly speaking, necessary to doing the jobs that need to be done. These are skills and abilities and knowledge that can be learned on the job. Um, and so, you know, this is, there are alternatives in that fashion, but the credentials are necessary to get the job because of, you know, whatever hiring standards are present with respect to, you must have a minimum of a bachelor's degree or a master's degree for a certain position, which seems to be more and more common these days in terms of sort of the a creeping escalation of hiring standards in, in especially in professional positions. Um, that's not as common in uh, operational business and industry roles as it is in, say, fields like 
law and medicine, where of course, you know, you can't practice at all without having a degree and a license to go with it. But when you weigh those two, do we see a prevalence of one more than the other in today's sort of modern career landscape? My personal opinion, and I'm going to put on my HR hat and combine that with, you know, my time in higher ed, I would be in the middle of those two positions. And here's the reason. Looking at the history, based on my experience as an HR professional, how degrees come into um, an organization system is the classification and compensation structure. Um, when I was in school, how I was taught, taught and in my first couple HR positions, um, we used to have specialists, that's all they did. Um, look at the market to see what the going rates were for different positions. And you would come up with this family um, family tree where you would classify each of the positions and come up with salary bands, how much you would pay an individual. And depending on the position, where did it fall in terms of level? And that also not only determined what the salary would be, but what was the required education level? In my opinion, that's an old model. Sometimes it will work, sometimes it doesn't because there's other factors that come into play so you cannot go with a cookie cutter program. Now I would venture to say, and and I have read and talked to certain individuals who subscribe fully with the credentialing perspective, and that is it was thought that you would need a bachelor's degree to do certain things. And those individuals are arguing, no, you do not. You just need credentials to prove that you could do the job. I understand their position. In terms of the other side of the house, what would probably get those individuals in trouble is to think that only higher ed can do it. And I think that's what our particular industry has to deal with and come to terms with is there are so many competitors in terms of new institutions being established as well as members from the private sector coming into the learning and development phase that can meet the needs that especially that employers have immediately. Institutions such as ourself, APIS, I think we would benefit from being able to talk to any of the sectors that we partner with and customize something by asking, but what does your organization need? And as we poll a number of our partners, we can see if there are some common threads and develop some type of action plan that would not only address the needs of our current partnerships, but some topics that could be a benefit to some future markets that we could explore or enter into. What do we say to, and, and I've encountered this question from students before, and I have my own answer, but I'm curious to, to hear what your philosophy is on this. What do we hear from, or, or what do we respond with to students who have sort of a, um, a cynical view of, of what we offer? And, and the argument usually goes something like this. I mean, there's, there's many different dimensions of this, but a popular one is to say, well, look at Steve Jobs and look at Elon Musk and look at Bill Gates and look at Mark Zuckerberg and you know some of the richest people in the world, arguably by that measure, the most successful people in the world who have achieved these extraordinary levels of success, not because of a college education, but really in spite of it, most of the preceding names having you know either some college or completing only an undergraduate or maybe no college at all. So from the standpoint, and, and you know, I'm happy to admit myself that my perspective may be biased as sort of a, uh, a professional in higher education, a proponent of higher education, and sort of a perpetual student in higher education. But what is our best argument or counter argument, if you will, from a higher education standpoint for those who believe that, you know, we may not be offering something of value that, that really adds to their career potential? I've had those questions as well, and I, I think I take a different approach. Instead of defending higher ed I ask that individual, but what do you want to do? What do you want to do in the short term? What do you want to do in the long term? And without me saying anything, how do you think you should get from point A to point B? Then I would listen to what they had to say, 
jot down some notes as to whether or not it makes sense. And what's interesting is I um, self-disclose that yes, I am in higher ed and I believe fully in what I'm doing, but at the same time, I can pull from my past experience which is an HR individual. So it gives the student a perspective of what I'm talking about in terms of what type of knowledge they need, but that also I can talk from the standpoint of what would an employer see as acceptable knowledge to do a particular position. By presenting that information, I get them to listen to me. And then I may share my own history Getting additional education helps with certification as well as getting promotions. But for someone that's just entering in, they really do like someone that has some of the experience. So to those individuals, I usually talk about how getting the education will help them to get promoted because it puts them one step ahead of someone who is just doing the work and who may not have opportunities to explore diversity of thought. And and by that, I think that's what higher education provides. It puts individuals from different backgrounds and perspectives into one environment and they have to discuss the same concepts. Um, What I think they have the opportunity to do is to hear some uh, someone else's perspective. And an example is one time I was teaching a human resource course, we were talking about a particular policy. Um, the students were from different um, backgrounds and lived in different geographic locations. And one of the things that we found out, and it has something to do with hiring and advertising, but depending where you are, in terms of your geographic location, as well as which industry you're in, how you would go about the process of advertising the job could be different. And it was interesting to hear that some students thought that the way that their organization did things was the only way. And that was the learning moment. And without being, I'm not saying it had to be a, a classroom setting, but it was an academic institution that brought them together and it challenged them to think outside of the box for themselves as well as to be open to hear what other people do. I don't think training programs, the pure training programs, provide that opportunity because they just want to teach a skill. And I think that's how higher ed can convince some organizations that they still are relevant because they can not only address the skill issue, but they can provide an environment that will allow people to explore, exercise problem solving skills, as well as critical skills. It's interesting. I often tell students asking questions like that. I say, well, yeah, it's it's not impossible to achieve tremendous success in spite of a college education or the lack of a, a college education. And so I use an analogy if you're if you're bowling, but your bowling ball is only the size of like a imagine like a softball. Is it possible to get a strike with a ball that small? The answer is yes, but your aim and your your impact has to be perfect. I mean, beyond the scope of just accuracy and just sheer luck and coincidence, you you need a tremendous amount of luck on your side to, to make it big with that kind of tool. Yet, as you increase the size and weight of your ball, you know, as I describe it to my students, getting a strike gets easier and easier to the point that, you know, eventually, if you can imagine a ball like the size of a beach ball, you know, you can almost close your eyes and just kind of kick it down the lane. And it's hard not to get a strike um, because you're working with such a superior tool. And uh, that's what I describe as higher education for my students, both in undergrad and at the graduate level, because I'm a, I'm a big proponent of continuing education, not just in higher ed and, and not just for degree purposes, but for certifications and whatnot. And I explained to them that as you continue to ascend those ranks and, and you earn a degree and then a graduate degree and, and even a doctorate degree or what other goals you have, your your bowling ball gets bigger and bigger and bigger until your odds of success increase exponentially with time that way. And that seems to be pretty compelling at making the argument that 
you know, it's not to say that it can't be done in the absence of a, of a formal education, but it's just much more difficult and you're, you're rolling the dice with much lower odds in your favor. Yeah, and it gets back to the practical comment that I made. That's a philosophical conversation that you can have, and I don't believe there's a right or wrong answer. But then at the same time, what reality is, although there are people um, in all sectors talking about whether or not it is needed, I haven't seen much transformation in an organization's compensation and classification system. So it's not at the level that these conversations are had. There are some organizations who have changed, but there are many more that have not. And the way that those systems are set up in order to get promotions, it does tie to an education level. So even with me posing the question, where are you trying to go? Unless you are about to start your own business, if you do have to go into some type of company during this period of your life, you may have to deal with an organization's compensation and classification system. And many of them still highlight the need for education formal as a tool to get promoted to the next level. And in some cases to even get hired into the company. I think you just raised a good point, which is for those that are self-employed or uh, aspiring to be self-employed and to own your own business, that's really something that you have to look at in terms of time frame of how long you intend to do that. And if you ever intend to venture into the world of, of working for somebody else, because I know I have my own consulting firm as a cell phone business, and I think you've you've done that before as well. The challenge that I see for that, for someone who has never had the, the benefit of experience on one's resume of working for some other company and, and a reputable company at that, is that you really don't have any credible testimony as to your experience beyond your own work. It's it's kind of a joke about it. And I say, if, if you're going to use your self-employment as your testament to your work history and your experience, and the prospective employer that wants to hire you asks you, you know, can I call your boss? And you say, yeah, just uh, here's my cell number. I'll, I'll be happy to give myself a wonderful review. You know, so they know that that's coming with a healthy dose of, of bias that isn't really uh, helpful versus, you know, if you're working for a very large, well-known, credible company, you know, uh, Microsoft, Apple, Chevrolet, I mean, whatever it is, then you have name recognition associated with your employer and some third party to, to vouch for you. And I, I think that that's, at least in my view, what students often miss about the higher education experience. I, I had a student in a law class way back when I was in Las Vegas who would later become a good friend of mine. But during the, uh, the course of the class, he said, you know, uh, he came up to me as almost a total stranger. This was before we knew each other. And he said, everything that you know about the law, I could learn on Google. My first reaction was sort of that narcissistic arrogance of, you know, how dare you? Uh, but I bit my tongue and, and I thought about it for a moment. And, and my response was actually, you're right. Uh, because there's nothing secret about law school or college in general, for that matter, you can buy the textbooks. And if you have the discipline to self-teach and, and to self-govern your uh, learning process, then have at it. But the problem is at the end of that process, who will take that experience seriously? Because there's no one to accredit the experience that you've had, the learning that has been imparted and, and the skills that you now have versus, you know, when you graduate with a degree or even a certification, that university, college, institution, what have you, literally says on your diploma, we impart all of the liberties, rights and, and privileges thereunto, you know, for the holder of a bachelor's of arts in, in whatever discipline. So they're literally vouching for your knowledge in that sense um, that adds credibility to what you've done. And I totally agree. And I think one of the factors that we haven't touched, and, and that involves why does this topic seem more relevant now? I'm of the position that it's a result of our society's disgust with student loan debt. And the fact that some type of entity has allowed our future generations to get to the point that they cannot dream about the future because they're heavily in debt. And I think that's where some of the arguments are also coming. Why don't you just self-teach? Why do you have to go to someone who now the public sentiment is not looking totally for the benefit of you, especially if they're putting you in debt? 
And I think those institutions who may have built a system that encourage that, those are going to be the ones that may not be around this time next year. So I don't think the value of higher education is really in question in some circles. I think it's a matter of how is higher education being delivered. We've been speaking with Dr. Marie Gould Harper about the value of higher education and professional careers, and we'll be back after a short break. Today's corporate world requires talented professionals who quickly rise to meet business needs on a global scale. At American Public University, we'll teach you how to meet the needs of domestic or international businesses. Take the next step and apply online at study at apu.com. Welcome back. We're speaking today with Dr. Marie Gould Harper about the value of higher education and professional careers. So when we left off, Marie, we were talking about the changing role that education is playing in the workplace and the way that it's being perceived by employers. I'm curious to ask you, because again, we're recording this in October of 2020 amidst the pandemic. And my suspicion is that a lot of today's employers that are being forced into a more remote paradigm due to the social distancing mandates and the need to separate people during the situation may retain some of that on their way back, um, may find that this isn't such a bad situation to be in, to have employees working from home and working remotely to the extent that they can. And so I wonder what your thoughts are in terms of whether higher education's value in the workplace will change as a result of the advent of technology and the push to remote working environments where more people are working uh, in a telecommuting environment or working from home? Um, yes, I, I personally do not believe that everyone's going back to the office. I know there are a number of people who are hoping they do not have to return to the office. And what I'm seeing as the plans that are coming out from some organizations who do plan, they're not going to have everybody at the same time. Um, they're coming up with schedules where, you know, group A may be going on Monday and Wednesday, group B going on Tuesday and Thursday, and those type of arrangements in terms of the day-to-day -day operations. Before the pandemic, there, just like everything else, there were two camps of thought. Some people believe that remote working could be um, beneficial, and it was something that an organization was capable of doing. But then you also had individuals who thought that you have to be in the office for social interaction, collaboration on different ideas. But the pandemic allowed some organizations to use their technology. And what they have found, some organizations have found that their employees are more productive when they are working from home. Um, I recently wrote a blog on that type of topic. And I just talked about my own experience because I've had remote status for the last 15 years working in three different organizations and know that it can be successful. And I think some of the workers who were forced into this type of situation are seeing the value. What I think is also important is that the leaders are seeing how this particular format is valuable. So what we call returning back, that could be many different things, but APIS is in the business of online learning. And I think in addition to organizations seeing that Working from home is valuable with utilizing the right technology. When they get to the learning and development functions, I think they're naturally going to um, want to explore online learning more so than they have in the past and look at it as an option, whether it's for skills training or it is to partner with a um, higher education institution that is skilled in the process so that their employees can continue to pursue degrees. Well, I would definitely agree. And uh, Marie, I must confess to, uh, to you as my supervisor that when this pandemic is over, I, I sure hope I don't have to return to the office. I'm, I'm liking this work from home thing. So. <laughs> 
for those listeners who, who don't know, uh, here at American Public University, most of our faculty and staff are remote, so we uh, rarely see each other in person, but for maybe once or twice a year at our large-scale faculty meetings. So this pandemic for us has been more or less business as usual. It hasn't changed much about what we do, with the exception that, of course, our our on-ground staff at our uh, campus locations have been, for the most part, moved home to work remotely. And and so far, I think, you know, speaking from my own perspective, that's that's worked pretty well. And and again, I think that's just more evidence of what we were just discussing, that a lot of employers will probably see that this is a viable model and something that will likely continue, at least in some capacity, after uh, the pandemic ends. As we move into just beyond even the scope of this pandemic, as we all sort of hope that um, moving forward, we'll have uh, either the emergence of herd immunity or the development of a vaccine um, that will inoculate us from this problem altogether and, and we can get back to some sense of societal normalcy. Um, we still have the issue that technologization um, in mass across all industries is completely revolutionizing the workforce and that the the, the workforce of tomorrow into the, the mid and later parts of the 21st century will probably look very different from what it is today. You know, I use the example of transportation workers. I had a, a podcast uh, just about this with uh, Dr. Larry Parker, our program director for our transportation logistics program. And um, we were discussing specifically that I think the figure is, you know, roughly one in 10 people worldwide are employed in some form of logistics and transportation, uh, whether it's driving trucks or limos or cabs or boats or planes or trains. Um, you know, there's, there's so much in that, but we can see already the, the signs that technology will soon take over most of those jobs in terms of automated vehicles and automated conveyances around the world, it's no longer having a need for drivers and conductors in these various capacities. So we will have to retool that workforce lest they you know, not have a way to, to feed their families. Um, and that makes me wonder if the higher education industry will have a capacity problem in the future with just meeting the needs of people who have to find more advanced skills for careers that require specific knowledge in computer hardware and computer software and the kinds of, of careers that will be more prevalent in the, the decades to come. Do you see that as a, a major challenge for us? I don't see it as a challenge. And I think the reason why I don't see it as a challenge in my perfect world, and it ties into what I have shared as what I believe the theme should be for our school of business is leading forward. Um, one, I do not believe we're going back to the way of doing business um, for a couple of reasons. One, I don't think it's healthy to ever go back. You should always strive to move forward because time continuously changes. Even if you put a product into play, it doesn't always last forever. Um, it will reach a maturity um, phase and you have to move to the next step. So if you look at that type of cycle and apply it to what we are experiencing now, some would argue it only makes sense is to look at where we are today and come up with the steps that we should take to at least move forward. And as we progress, depending on external factors, things may change again. So we can't develop a plan and saying we're literally going to see ourselves at this point in five years. Because a lot of things can happen. Just think if, if we made that statement in 2018. It's um, two years into the five-year plan and we're hit with a pandemic. What do you do? You rise to the occasion, which is the sub-theme of how we're trying to even transform our programs is what caught everyone off guard was a crisis management situation that happened quick. And no one thought because they had not experienced what to do next. So I believe as higher education institutions, as we're teaching different subjects, we have to address the what if. There has to be more than one option because we, we have experienced how you cannot depend on a perceived outcome. You have to have different options. And I, I think um, once you take that approach, you start to take one day, one week, one year at a time because you never know um, what's going to happen. And getting back to the term that was used in the workshop yesterday, when you have to pivot. 
It's an interesting question to me as we move forward, because I, I think about the, the different paths that people might take as we approach that. The parts of our future that I think are relatively certain, as you mentioned, there's a lot of unpredictability right now. We have the pandemic that we have no end in sight to, at least in the immediate term. Um, we're all hoping for a quick resolution, but we're now somewhere on the order of eight to 10 months into this, uh, depending on where you look at the starting point for the US at least. And uh, it doesn't seem to be getting better. In fact, I was just watching the morning news and um, some states are hitting records in terms of new cases, diagnoses and issues. So uh, we don't seem to have flattened the curve the way we had hoped. And uh, we don't have any definite horizon for uh, a vaccine at this moment. But even beyond that, we look at the forces of technologization and um, and automation that are poised to hit industries everywhere. I think, regardless of whether or not you know we we have these other forces um, or they ameliorate themselves somehow. And I use the example of Disney, for example. I, you know, I live here in uh, in Orlando, and I'm literally a mile away from the Magic Kingdom where I live. The parks are now open at limited capacity, but Disney has gone out of its way even before the pandemic, of course, to reduce its overhead, its labor, because this is the number one cost for any business and particularly for theme parks, uh, heavy on staffing. And so now more than ever, there's a pressure for them to do more in terms of operations with fewer people. And so they're employing to the fullest extent possible technology and automation available in their parks to make the experience uh, as fulfilling for their guests as possible without detracting from that and, of course, reducing the headcount and the amount of exposure, human contact that's required. And as I think about that future sort of playing out in all industries, I think there will be some who look to higher education to retool them for skills that they didn't need before because, you know, maybe they were doing fine as, uh, again, either a truck driver or a restaurant server or what have you, but we just don't have those positions the way that we do now. But the other piece of it is, of course, some experts are projecting that the end game for this automation revolution will be unemployment on the order of like 40%, 50%, which means that even if we could retool everybody, there just wouldn't be enough jobs for everyone. And so I wonder if that will dissuade some in the workforce from even looking at higher education as valuable and saying, well, this is a, a rigged game for me. I might as well just sit back and wait for some form of, say, universal basic income or other proposals that have come on the table for that. But I, I wonder how the higher education role will evolve um, as these forces kind of play out in the next 10 to 20 years even. Well, as a leader um, in higher ed, I personally think we have to be able to look to the future to see what will be needed because that's what organizations are doing. That's what the executives are doing. Um, some of them are already changing what they do. I've seen a number of um, restaurants as well as manufacturers they have basically taken what they had and reused their or reallocated their resources to go into different lines of business. As a higher education institution, we need to track and keep a pulse on that because we have to see where they're going in order to come up with curriculum that addresses where people are going because that's what they say they want anyway. That's how they define their retooling and reskilling and upskilling individuals. The upskilling part is directed towards what they see as their future. The reskilling, I believe, is to help them in the short term. So if they're coming up with those type of plans, they're looking at what is needed for that. So it's in our best interest to follow those trends. And then as we assist them with these new opportunities, and I think that's where the jobs are going to come from, there may be a, a lot of people losing their jobs right now, but they are losing certain positions with specific skill sets that are required. They are no longer needed. So what are they supposed to do? What do the organizations need? What will those positions be called? And what type of skill set and education level is needed to do those jobs? And it's almost how we say the new norm. It'll be the new economy. It's, it's going to be a shift. And I think the learning lesson, we never had a name for it. And we never used to say pivot. But I think what organizations are looking for are individuals who have the capacity to learn. And that regardless of what the situation is, 
they will be able to shift and transform themselves in terms of adapting the skills that are needed to do whatever particular jobs are needed at the time. I believe this whole pandemic situation has taught a number of individuals that you can't rely on the old way of doing business because it may become obsolete before you're ready for it to become obsolete. And if you want to continue in your business, what will you need to do? I look at the restaurants, especially the ones in my area. I live in an area where people love to go out to dine. Um, When the pandemic hit, we very easily and very quickly adopted the new norm. And the new norm for my area was we don't have to go to the restaurants. That's when Uber Eats and DoorDash became very um, popular, whereas it has become an acceptable way of getting your meals. Um, I seen so many restaurants who immediately came up. You have three choices. You can have it delivered by one of the services. You can come and pick it up or you can come to the restaurant and order it and just wait. So that may not be ideal for a lot of people, but I saw how many communities adopted and adapted to the new standards of eating and dining out. Now, even though some of the restaurants are now um, having guests in in, in um, restaurant dining, um, it's very limited and it's they've made the social distance acceptable. But you see those as the individuals who are like, I just need to be in the location that's preparing my food. But the restaurants have created for options for people depending on what their preference. And one of the newest options that I've seen are restaurants. One restaurant I know has created a a store, an Italian store. It's an Italian restaurant. So now not only do they prepare the food, but they sell the food for people who may want to prepare the meals at home. And then I've also seen some restaurants who will have their menu reflect what is called a bundle meal. And it's a meal for maybe four to five people. So they are preparing meals for households, the whole household, and and have priced it to the point that an individual can call and, and have dinner for a family of five. And it's seen as the norm now. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of innovation and, and improvisation taking place right now to try to to make the most of what is obviously a difficult situation for the service industry, uh, among many others. Most of my career was spent years ago in, in hospitality, so I have a lot of friends and colleagues who are actively looking for work now and finding ways to kind of to make the best you know lemonade out of these lemons that we've been given with the the pandemic. I know we're at time and I wanted to try to, to ask just one more question if I could with regard to our overarching topic, which is the value of higher education. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on where the value lies because whenever we talk about the value of something, we have to obviously assess input and output. And output for higher education is the end product, the, the degree or the diploma, the accreditation that, that affords you opportunities that you might not have otherwise. But the input, of course, in addition to a student's time and effort is their tuition. We know it's no secret that tuition rates in colleges and universities have far exceeded the pace of inflation since three, four decades ago. And so it's much more expensive relative to the average income today uh, for students to earn a degree than you know it was in, say, the 1970s. Now, you know, speaking for APUS, I know that our rates are competitive and I think we have affordable programs and products here. And absolutely. And we have the unique circumstance, of course, where a significant portion of our student population are either active duty or veteran military. Uh, So they have the benefit of the GI Bill that helps to ameliorate a lot of the out-of-pocket costs that other students might face. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts in terms of the future for higher education in general. Um, Does a, a major reassessment need to take place of the, the fees and assessments being offered or, or being proffered, you know, put forth by the industry, or does the government need to step in in sort of a Bernie Sanders style plan to subsidize education for people uh, to make it accessible on the on the scale that will be needed in the future? Um, I have two thoughts. First of all, I believe that higher education will still be around for the sole reason that I don't think 
training skills training is going to be enough and that's because most skills training you do not get the critical thinking and problem solving exposure so that's the main reason why i think that higher ed will still be around however we're seeing it in other industries the consumers are going to shape whether or not some businesses will still be in business. And I don't believe government's going to have to step in because if the situation with tuition doesn't get un- under control, who's going to want it? So that's another thing that lies in the hands of higher ed. Um, what are you going to do to survive? Yeah, it would seem there's there's two options, either to self-regulate and allow sort of capitalism to work itself out there where, uh, you know, we compete. And, and again, I think APUS is highly competitive in terms of the rates offered. But uh, the other option, of course, is that the government steps in and, and provides some subsidy to allow people to access the education that used to be, historically speaking, more affordable relative to income than uh, it is today. I would look and get a pulse on what is occurring in our society to see what are the consumers, potential students, what are they willing to accept and what are they not willing to accept? I think that's going to be a driving force. In terms of the regulation, I personally don't think we will get to that point where we have to force because those who don't abide will disappear. But I also think that in addition to having education in terms of gainful employment, I think people look at education as a way to just keep abreast of new knowledge, new ideas. So they see the the value of education from an arts perspective and not only from a science perspective. And I still want to hope that people love the idea of learning new things. And I think there's a role for a number of different types of entity, but I think higher ed will always be the leader of the pack. And when I say higher ed, I mean the institutions that are able to reinvent themselves. I think that's a great point. I think another piece that um, people often forget in the pursuit of their own personal ambitions is that, um, you know, a, a functioning society like ours only works if, if people understand key issues and are educated at a minimal level to be able to contribute in a meaningful way. I think it was Thomas Jefferson who said, and, and I'm going to butcher the quote exactly, but it was something like, um, an informed citizenry is essential to a functioning democracy. You know, the idea being that if the people aren't educated enough to understand what they're voting on and, and what's important, that society in a democracy doesn't work. So these are all compelling reasons why, you know, higher education, I think, has a a vital role to play. And um, hopefully we'll see that serve a a more helpful function in the years ahead, in addition to what we've already done and and are continuing to do. Well, I want to thank you, Marie, for sharing your expertise and perspectives with us on these topics. And thanks for joining me today for this episode of Intellectable. It was a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Likewise. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. Be well and stay safe, everyone. For more information about our university, visit us at studyatapu.com. APU, American Public University.